So anyway, so for sure meditation is about practice. There's no other way. The quick fix doesn't leave too much results. So if you look at the word, uh, you know, meditation, the original roots in Sanskrit and Tibetan, bought is something about cultivating. So you could cultivate loving kindness. You could cultivate you know, presence and focus attention. You could cultivate emotional intelligence, inner peace, inner freedom. And the other word uh, from the Tibetan means more to become familiar with something. So again, it could be familiar with loving kindness that may be not so present in your mind, but also familiar with the way your mind works. So sometimes, you know, when people say, oh, I try meditation, it's really not for me. You know, I thought it's emptying your mind and this has so many thoughts, more than ever. It's not that you, there's more thoughts, that you be just become a little bit aware of the extent of the catastrophe. Because you have not been watching your mind. And if you hope that the mind will suddenly become empty, of course, you will be soon discouraged. That will never happen anyway. So familiar with the workings of the mind, or one thought, a little bit of resentment. Why me? Why did he do that? Just a little thought. And spread and spread and spread. And f invades your mental landscape and become full-fledged resentment. So familiar with the way the mind works. Familiar with the fact that behind the screen of thoughts, there is this kind of natural luminosity of the mind, which is like a light. If you light a heap of garbage, it doesn't become dirty. If you light a heap of gold, it doesn't become expensive. It's just the faculty to know the basic awareness that is not modified by the content. So we are not so familiar with that. So you need to look within the mind. So now, that's why also many of the meditation techniques begin, you don't want to empty your mind. How can you empty your mind? You'll be dead or, or fainted. <laughs> And then how can you block the thoughts? When the thought is there, how can you say, oh, I wish you were not there? It's there. <laughs> so it's more about becoming how to deal with that. So yes, it is helpful to have a mind that is more clear, more stable, and more calm. And that's why most of these concentration techniques, like watching the breath, works. So I think most of you, those who are meditating, are familiar with watching the breath. All that is wonderful tool to bring about wisdom, compassion, other qualities. But today, since his holiness, you know, since I was fortunate to meet him and again and again for the last 30 years or so, how extraordinary emphasis he puts on loving kindness and compassion. So I thought, how do we cultivate that? You know, recently I was in Hong Kong a few days ago and someone who says he's a specialist of mindfulness. I say, why don't you do caring mindfulness? He says, what's that? How do I do that? So the fact that you may not think that you could not cultivate loving kindness. So how you do? Well, everyone, we all have, have moments of unconditional benevolence or love for somebody. You know, for a child, for someone, someone we don't know. Just like pure wishing that this person may be happy, safe, flourish in life, be spared suffering. But you know, this comes and goes. We may do that for 20 seconds, a minute, and then some other thoughts come, somebody comes in the room and it's gone. We don't cultivate that in the same way that we do physical exercise for 20 minutes a day. Why? We don't mind learning how to read and write, to become fit. Why those qualities for which we have the potential will become at the optimal without us doing much at all. That's what we call the most basic, latent, dormant potential, but not a fully actualized potential. So that feeling of unconditional benevolence that we know, we have experienced, why don't we try to bring it now and let it fill our mental landscape? And instead of letting it disappear, if it goes away, come back to it. If it sort of sinks, revive it, nurture it, maintain it, let it fill your entire, ment entire mental landscape. Let every atom of your mind be filled with benevolence and every atom of the other person be filled with happiness or 
the suffering of every being, every atom of suffering be filled with compassion. So that cultivate that, maintain that. And it's easy to start with someone whom we love naturally, but then why only this child? Why not other child? And why stop, what, at seven years old? And after that you don't deserve benevolence and compassion? So extend it to many other beings, those you don't know. Also, they don't, they don't wake up in the morning thinking, may I suffer the whole day? And what about animals? Do you know any animals who wants to suffer, who doesn't want to escape from suffering? So extend that benevolence to all. And don't say, oh, accept those few which I cannot stand. Your benevolence is to wish that they may change their minds so that they don't express the qualities of harmfulness that they have displayed like sick people. Look at them as a fully benevolent physician who wish only thing that they may cure from whatever makes them harm others. So let's try for the few minutes we have to begin with the easy, you No, know, it's like you learn sailing in the sea, you don't start with a big storm. Start with the, someone for whom it's very easy, then one that is really present in your mind, that quality extended to others, first stranger, and then include the so-called difficult cases, think it, how nice it would be if their hatred, cruelty, indifference, greed could disappear like a skillful physician really wanting to, that someone might cure. So then there should be no barrier to loving kindness and compassion, including all sentient beings. So, you know, the French poet Lamartine said, especially about extending to other form of life, we don't have two hearts, one for human beings, one for other species. We have a heart or we don't. So let's try to include all sentient beings. Let's just do that for a few minutes. Nothing, nothing special, just do it. So you see, we did that just a few minutes, but imagine you could continue for 10, 20 minutes. And just the last thing, sometimes people say we don't have time. No, anyone doesn't have 10 seconds every hour? Nobody is in it. So our friend Meng, who's a good friend of Richie and Dan and myself, 
He came out with this idea. We thought he was totally crazy. He's such a joker. To every hour, or let's say six times a day, okay, for 10 seconds, you look around, you're not jump on people and kiss them, I love you. Again, that's not going to work. You think, look at them, and look at you in the street, through the window, in your workplace, sitting next to you in the, in the subway, and you just think, may this person be happy, be safe, flourish in life. If a person has any suffering, may somehow the cause of suffering be dispatched. Just pure goodness, 10 seconds. And then another, how you do that again. You might say, well, 10 seconds is not going to change anything. But think of this example of opening a bottle of perfume for 10 seconds. Well, usually monks don't do that very often, but... <laughs> and then when you close it, the perfume stays for 10 minutes. If you do it often enough, it will be there all the time. So, you know, after those 10 seconds, you can't just go somewhere and shout something terribly hurtful. So there will be something that will linger through the hour until the next 10 seconds that will give a different fragrance to your life. So that actually seems quite superficial, the ultimate stupid easy fix. But in fact, it's quite profound because we say often that it's better to do short, repeated period of practice than a big one from time to time. You know, it's like the flowers in your apartment. Little water every day, a bucket every month, and the plant is dead in between. So nurture that every on and off, just having this thought. Just may all these things be happy. So nice when you are in the tube or somewhere. It just feels completely different. And 